Yes, ladies and gentlemen, as I said before, I am Charles Melville Dewey, <coughs> and I am an artist. I am perhaps best known for my landscape paintings, and being an artist of the late 19th century, I was drawn to the totalism movement, a highly romantic style of painting, quite dark and misty and such, yet quite beautiful and evocative. Many of my landscapes feature brilliant sunsets or sunrises or moonrises and can be seen today in many private collections and not a few major museums, such as the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and the Albright Knox Art Gallery, to name just a few. Now, my reason for being here this evening is because of the fact that I was born right here in Laudel, to a farming family. Now, my parents couldn't fathom the idea of my desire to become an artist, but I could, and took a job as a janitor to pay my way through art school. And not just any art school. I went to New York City to study at the National Academy of Design there. Then, I went all the way to Paris for two years. I was even asked by my mentor, let's see if I can pronounce it in French, Haru Duran. I don't know if I said that right, but to, it's been a long time since I've been to Paris. <laughs> <laughs> to assist him in painting a ceiling in the Louvre Museum. I thought that was pretty, pretty special. Soon I had my first exhibit and opened my own art studio. You know, I have to say, I've had a charmed career in art. And I've been amply awarded for my work, so I have no complaints. Would, would you indulge me for a minute more? I'd like to share with you a review of my work that appeared in the, the New York Times. Nothing is more marked in Mr. Dewey's work than its intellectual force. One of the most important and original masters of our American landscape school not only continues to fulfill the promise of his earlier work, but is producing from year to year work of increasing power and beauty. Not bad for a boy from Laudel. <laughs> I'm so glad to be back home to help usher in the Christmas season with all of you. Because I have to tell you that in my, most of my teenage years, I was confined to bed due to a, we'll say, a long, mysterious illness. And I wasn't able to go outside and play at Christmas time when the other kids were sledding down hills and going Christmas caroling. But I could just about manage to perch by my window and stare out into the beautiful winter wonderland landscape that was my home here in Laudel. These were the times, I'm convinced, that, that inspired my love of painting landscapes, wanting to capture what I couldn't experience cooped up inside all the time. Well, finally, when I no longer was confined to the indoors, how wonderful it felt to participate in everything that Christmas season had to offer, including Christmas caroling with friends. So right now, I would like to relive one of those moments and ask an old friend of mine to come up here and sing with me, Terry Mars. I'm not that old, Charlie. <laughs> well, I am. <laughs>
Now, we are very pleased to introduce the esteemed Colonel Walter Martin. Thank you very much for your service, Colonel. Good evening. Please address me as Brigadier General Walter Martin. I commanded the 26th Brigade of the New York Militia during the War of 1812. I'll let you decide how to greet me. As we celebrate this evening, I'm very proud to say that I was one of the early proponents for creating this new Lewis County that we celebrate tonight. I first visited the area in 1801, promptly buying up some 8,000 acres of land south of Lowell for James Constable as agent for his brother, William Constable. I immediately began reselling parcels of property to friends and acquaintances and returned with my family the following year in 1802. I established the village of Martinsburg in 1803 for part of the land I purchased from the Constable. I made sure to retain most of the water rights across the vast tract I had acquired and began to build mills and sell lumber and supplies. This is when I set about building the most substantial and conspicuous house at the time in Lewis County, Greystone Manor. Building begun in 1803 and finished in 1805 and was, in style and finish, a faithful copy of Sir William Johnson's dwelling Fort Johnson Hall in the Mohawk Valley. Throughout the years, my home had a buried history, having been a convalescent home for Canadian soldiers during World War I, a private residence, and as an old newspaper clipping refers to it, a wayside tavern? I certainly hope this wayside tavern didn't sully the Martin name. I trust the food and drink were of high quality. Did anyone here partake? <laughs> Back to history. I served in the New York State Senate from 1808 to 1812, during which time I helped propose this new Lewis County and then successfully campaigned to have Martinsburg established as the county seat. I then began planning to raise funds for the construction of a courthouse the first court was held in the new building on January 7, 1812. It was used as a courthouse until 1864 when the county seat was moved to Lago. The Lewis County Historical <coughs> Society caused the bronze historical marker to be placed on the outside of the building to help preserve its historical significance for coming generations. In my later years, I was happy to serve as postmaster to Martinsburg for 30 years. The Christmas season here in my beautiful Lewis County is remarkable in so many ways. The landscape with the snow falls making everything crisp, white, and new. The sound of sleigh bells and carolers, and of course, the comfort of home. The warmth of the fireplace, the laughter of family, the children and friends, there's nothing that can compare. <laughs> Oh! 
doppelganger of mine. I think you are. Because I used to be told I couldn't carry a tune back in the 1880s. Well, something changed. <laughs> well, I had to take my jacket off because this is a hoot nanny song. And we have a couple of young people right here. Come on down. I want to sing this to you. Are there any other young people, even young at heart, who'd like to come up here and sit right here? Anybody? Come on. <laughs> you can stay for the next few songs because we have people your age in mind for these next songs. Come right up here. He's a red steps. Yes, a red steps. Yep. Yeah. All right. So this is a fun song. It's kind of like my memories of when I was a kid uh, going to Grandma's house and going for all the different holidays. Christmas was a special one. We're going to do that. Oh, and I have a backup group. I've got Steve Pinson on guitar and Angela Bartlett on her. What do you call this drum? The Fox drum. Oh, Fox drum. Absolutely. <laughs>
bring back Angela Bartlett, and they're going to perform for the kids and all of us kids at heart, Old Toy Train. Welcome Steve Kennison to tell you about one such teacher from the history 
of Lewis County. A teacher's influence on a child's life can literally transform their future. Not only in the course and direction of a career, but in self-esteem and self-empowerment. Such a teacher was Luther B. Aspen. Born in 1887 in Florence, Massachusetts, he was known as the Sousa of the North Country and the first African-American teacher at Laudel Academy. Mr. Askin was introduced to Laudel after he joined the Archie White Minstrel Band, which had a one-night gig in town. That one-night gig in 1908 would soon transform music education in Lewis County and the North County. His coronet solo at that gig resulted in, in a contract to direct the town band. Mr. Askin would go on to marry his wife Ruth and together had one son, Norman Luther Askin. Askin registered for World War I draft in June of 1917, where his description lists him as tall, stout, not bald, with blue eyes and light hair. His registration card lists him as Caucasian. However, his father, Luther Askin, is known as the earliest known instance of integration in baseball in 1865. His team, the Florence Eagles of Western Massachusetts, lost only six games in three years. In 1920, Askin started lessons in Huntsville, Canada with Herbert L. Clark who was the best known coronet player in America at the time. Clark served as coronet soloist for the world famous John Philip Sousa Band and conducted that ensemble on many victory records. He told Askin that Askin played the coronet like the very best professional musicians in the country. Askin replied, that he had started lessons at the age of 14 in Holy Oak, and then studied with Ned Lafferty, who played first trumpet in the Boston Opera. It seems that Mr. Askin had been trained by some of the best teachers himself, which influenced him, as he would later influence countless of Lowville and North Country music students. By 1927, he studied violin at the Utica Conservatory of Music. He was awarded a Bachelor of Science degree in 1938 at Cornell University. Principal Liam Davis hired Mr. Askin as a part-time faculty member in 1927. The Laval Academy Band, formed a year later, with 15 members. Today, the school's music program has seven different ensembles where approximately 200 plus students participated in one or more of these bands. Mr. Askin could teach anyone to play any instrument, with the exception of the piano. During the 1930s, Maldo was one of two state bands selected for national competitions when finally in 1938, the band did participate in the national contest in Albany. The band also performed at the 1939 World's Fair in New York. Over a half century after Luther B. Askin's death, several obituaries included in his continued influence on his students. Gerald Reed's family stated that Jerry transferred from General Martin Central School in 1938 to Laval Academy with the purpose of playing in Mr. Aston's band. After graduation, he played trumpet in the Laval Village Band for many years. 
Dr. Earl Byrne described Askin as one of the most influential teachers he had. These are only a few of the tributes and accolades Mr. Askin received over the years. His career lasted over 60 years until his death in 1966. And in true John Philip Sousa style, we would like to dedicate this song to Mr. Haskin and the remarkable legacy he left to his students and the community.
Charmin. <laughs>
During this trip, I discovered more species of birds than I had been able to find on the East Coast. Later that year, I published my first book, Birds Through an Opera Glass, which is now considered the first bird field guide in modern tradition. My goal in writing the book was to interest not only young observers, but also laymen to know the common birds they see around them. I went on to write over 10 books, including several field guides to birds, as well as nearly 100 articles. I continued to be concerned about the treatment of birds and became involved in the conservation movement. My activism helped pass the Lacey Act of 1900. This law prohibited the trade of wild animals that had been illegally killed. This was a major victory for bird protection. More laws followed, leading to the end of exotic feathers in fashion. I was also a proud member of the Women's National Science Club and co-founded the Audubon Society of the District of Columbia in 1897. I was the first woman elected a fellow of the American Ornithologist Union in 1931, as well as the first woman recipient of the Brewster Medal of Honor. Growing up here in Lewis County, the Christmas season meant time outdoors in nature with my family. Sleigh rides, snow, and laughter are some of my most treasured memories of the season. <laughs>
your devil. Indeed. <laughs> am I supposed to say something else? I yes, I am. I am, 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 am very happy to welcome <laughs> Mary Leach. <laughs>
years when our four boys were little were very, very special to us. My maiden name is Mary Eliza McVicker, and I married my husband, William Pastel Jr. My uh, husband's father, William Pastel Sr., was well known for his part in uh, the Combs Purchase, which was the largest land deal in New York State at the time in the late 1700s. More than three million acres in the North Country. Mm -hmm. My uh, father-in-law was friends and business associates with people I'm sure you've heard of, George Martha Washington, Alexander Hamilton, and many others, names you would recognize. Now, when my husband saw this 300-acre plot of land his father has purchased, had purchased as part of that deal, he fell in love with it and designed and built Constable Hall. The federal-style mansion was designed after a family manor they had in Ireland. Construction took nine years and was finally completed <coughs> in 1819. The final part of construction was to place a large stone that weighed several tons on the front of a portico when a terrible accident happened that injured my dear William. And he would be bound to a wheelchair for the next two years. And then he would pass away from infection in 1821. He was just 36 years old. We were devastated. I was with child when he died, her daughter Anna. I was widowed with five small children living in a house that my husband gave his life for. But life moves on when you live in the North Country. Now growing up in New York City, I was very close with my cousins, one of them being Clement Clark Moore. Now during this difficult time in my life and even before uh, William's death, Clement would come and visit at Constable Hall and, and take in the fresh air, the, the beautiful grounds, and, and the architecture that my dear, my dear William was, was just so proud of. In 1822, he wrote the beloved Christmas poem, A Visit from St. Nicholas, or as you might know it, Twas the Night Before Christmas. It's actually the 200th anniversary this year. There are several parts of the poem that I am so pleased to tell you were actually inspired by the hall. There is the mention of interior shutters, which the hall has 42 sets of. Do you remember the words from the poem? He tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. And his description of St. Nicholas, which would come to be the definitive description of Santa, sounds like in describing in detail our family's Dutch gardener named Peter. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry, his white beard, his broad face, and a round belly that shook like jelly. You get, you get the idea. Girls, you want to come on up? All right, have a seat. Now, Clint visited me and my children during the holidays, those first difficult years during the holidays of my womanhood. He would come to comfort us, and he would read that poem in our drawing room, actually. And that has become a tradition that my family still holds dear to this day. <laughs> Stop me. 
ladder. I sprang from my bed to see what was the matter. Oh, away to the window I flew like a flash, and broke open the shutters, threw open the sash.
up your time and talents is just something that is so humbling. So, with that, thank you, and we would love for all of you to achieve your appreciation. People will be passing around baskets to help you help us, and also we have two more days of the holiday festival tomorrow and Saturday, and then have a little break for Christmas, and we have our concert series coming up in January. So thank you again for all your support.